You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, my name is Flight Lieutenant Peter Lisney, and in today's extended episode, we'll discover why the RAF is looking to artificial intelligence to provide information advantage. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them, But first, see if you can identify this noise. Find out if you were right at the end of this episode. Now, electronic devices on Earth, in space and even in our pockets constantly generate masses of data. Gaining information advantage by using all this data has become the challenge. So, could artificial intelligence and machine learning be the keys? Artificial intelligence is actually closer to human psychology than it is to computer science. If you have something that is able to learn itself, how can you be sure of the decisions that it will make? It's a never-ending electronic battle. I'm joined today by Air Commodore Jess Holmes and Professor Patrick Baker from the RAF Rapid Capabilities Office. And they're here to shed light on how the Royal Air Force is looking to artificial intelligence and machine learning to provide C4ISR advantage. Air Commodore Jez, Professor Patrick, thank you for joining us on Inside Air. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, thank you. Before we start talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, can you tell us what is meant by C4ISR? Uh, C4ISR. So command and control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Let me just chip in on on that if I could, because, you know, let's let's have a think about why why we actually collect data and turn it into information. So the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance is all about collecting data. But but we don't collect it just for the fun of it. What we try and do is get information out of it that we can act on. Uh, And the the way in which we do that acting on is to be able to disseminate that information to the right person at the right time. And that's where the computer and communications uh, come in, and then that enables us to do the control. So it is about you know control of uh, operations. So that's how that all kind of wraps together and why you end up with a long acronym like that. I guess it started during World War I, aerial reconnaissance, sending information back to uh, uh, commanders. Um, I, it, yes, and uh, my, my old squadron, two squadron, was very much part of that. But I suspect you could go back even further than that to the use of balloons um, and uh, using it, or even uh, you know the tops of hills. The reality is that yeah, any good commander would be able to best control the forces that he had under his command to have the best possible effect to win the battles and win the over war if he understood the situation. Uh, and the way you understand the situation is to collect as much of the information as you possibly can and make sure you get it at the right place. OK, so what you're talking about here is situational awareness rather than effect. Yeah, absolutely. This is about understanding understanding your environment uh, and understanding you know, what are you facing against, uh, what's the likely responses when you act, how do you best employ your forces, uh, because that's what we're about, making sure we achieve effect. Yeah, I think you can you could probably go back to, to you know Roman times on that from commanders, you know, and, and even lighting fires on top of hills, uh, um, you know, to to indicate that there were enemies uh, approaching, um, is another another example. So I think we've always done it. I just think the electronic revolution is obviously made this a lot faster with a lot more information. Now looking forward. Uh, artificial intelligence has been is a term that's been banded around for many years and it's uh, in Hollywood but it's now becoming part of the everyday lexicon of the Royal Air Force what is artificial intelligence 
So artificial intelligence, um, the actual descriptor for it, which is, as you are correct, banded around in our lives daily with absolutely everything, is the uniform um, statement that covers everything that a machine could do in the context of, of particularly showing intelligence. For example, there's a quite simplistic test called the Turing test. This is where you test a computer system to see if it shows any intelligence whatsoever. And that could be quite simplistic. Uh, so, for example, if you have Alexa at home, um, you will have found out when you ask Alexa to find one of your favorite songs that either A, it throws something else up, um, or B, completely fails to, fails to find anything at all. Um, so certain systems exhibit a level of intelligence, or they, they kind of show us they've got a level of intelligence. But in reality, um, the term artificial intelligence, um, if it's used correctly, implies that the system has the cognitive ability to make a decision in the same manner that a human would. Okay, and it's that ability to make a decision that makes this a real hot topic. Uh, particularly, um, we'll, we'll talk about ethics later. Now, machine learning. What is the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Okay, so, so artificial intelligence, and in particular, artificial general intelligence, which is what, uh, what we're all striving towards, where you have a system that is cognitive. Artificial intelligence can react to unknown situations or unknown inputs. Machine learning, on the other hand, by its very, the nature of its name is a bit of a giveaway. It either has to have, A, learnt that, yet previously or be in the process of learning how to react to an input. Now, that input could be audio, it could be visual, it could be anything. But at the end of the day, where we are today with machine learning, um, if it doesn't recognize that input, yeah, the machine learning at that point will fail. So can I see if I can add some color to that? And this is where Professor Pratchett will clearly correct me if I get it wrong. The, the example <laughs> I use... I don't think I will. The example I use is... Um, let's say we want to identify whether an object is a tank or not. Um, with machine learning, you have to teach the machine what a tank is. And typically the way that's done is to show it thousands and thousands of images of tanks in various different guises, shapes, colors, types, and so on. And it starts to learn what a tank looks like. Um, now, that obviously takes a lot of effort, and you still have to give it the right pictures to learn. So you still need a load of analysts to, uh, to generate that database that the machine can then learn from. Um, and how powerful your machine is will you know, derive how quickly it's able to do that learning. But that's not how you or I work. Uh, if, uh, if you'd never seen a tank before and I showed you one picture and said, hey, that's a tank, it's got wheels, it's got a turret, it's got a gun and all the rest... Um, and then you looked out the window and saw another tank, but it was in a different angle or it was a different color or partially hidden behind a, um, you know, a building, you as a human would be able to say, hey, that's a tank. But if a machine hasn't seen that particular type of context, you know, there's a good chance it won't actually identify that as a tank. So it, it's almost a very advanced and rapid form of uh, correlation of data. If... Artificial intelligence reacts to unknowns. How can you make decisions based on what you don't know? Well, this is quite interesting. So humans are spontaneous anyway, and we do react to unknowns. Yeah, it, it's part of the way that our brain functions. Um, machines at this point in time do not function in that manner um, with through machine learning. They need to understand. So a computer system that is fully cognitive, whatever age of, uh, of cognitive ability that has. So, for example, a 10-year-old. Um, if you imagine the way a 10-year-old would react to certain threats, yeah, for example, crossing the road, um, yeah, or e or even you know a, 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 a more difficult threat. Um, eventually, we hope that artificial general intelligence will be able to react 
much faster to a number of complex inputs that would, would exceed the ability of a fully cognitive human. So, for example, um, and I know Jez was, was flying aircraft for, for a number of years, um, lots and lots of inputs, lots and lots of, uh, of decision making instantaneously, yeah, based on the information available. If you increase the number of inputs to a human, yeah, eventually they just go tilt. They just cannot cope with that level of input. Um, whereas a machine, if we can, if the if the cognitive level is high enough, it will be able to react to all of those inputs, whether it expected them or not. Yeah. So so that is a huge step forward in our ability to deal with situations that are extremely stressful. So in uh, an air warfare environment, will the pilot still make the final decision of whether to deploy a weapon? Uh, a hundred percent. In the in the United Kingdom, our, our policy is that we don't have autonomous weapon systems. What does that mean? That means that it that a, a, a you know autonomous system could make its own decisions on what to engage or not engage, and we always need human involvement in the authorization of the use of lethal force. Uh, but perhaps if I just um, take you on a slightly different direction uh, on your question about decision making. Uh, and I'm going to come back to my uh, tank example because I like to keep things simple for Jez. Um, and, and if you imagine that we had a thousand photographs of, uh, of things that could have tanks in, how would we analyse that right now? And we would have a team of analysts going through each image one at a time, depending on the fidelity, how big the image was and so on. It would take a period of time to do that analysis. You'd be reasonably certain that when you got to the end of it, they had made all, made all the right calls, but it depends how long they were awake for and, and so on. And had they had a good meal the night before? And were they stressed? And you know, were they under fire? And a range of other questions. So, so what about this? We use machine learning and say, Okay, yeah, I want the machine learning to look at those thousand images. Now, if it comes out with the answer that there's 10 with tanks in, do I actually have to believe it or not? And what level of confidence do I have that that is the answer? But that's not the way to play this. Imagine if you still have your analyst, right? And then you, you put your thousand images through your machine learning and out comes the, the, the answer that here's 10 images and here's the priority because this is the one I've been most certain about. Your analyst now has to look at 10 image, images and not a 1,000. You know, that's two orders of magnitude change in the speed at which a human can make a decision. So often we talk about AI, not AI, you know, machine learning, not machine learning, human decision, not human decision. You know, we talk about it in this digital context, it's either on or off. Actually, what we're talking about is supercharging the human ability. Uh, and when Patrick talks about the inputs to to an air you know an aircrew um, made in a in a fast jet or any other aircraft, yes, you're getting a lot of inputs. But imagine if you only got the really important inputs, um, and you were able to concentrate on the critical decisions. Let's let's look at um, a Harrier versus the F thirty five B. They're both able to to hover and land vertically on a carrier. Landing a, a, a Harrier was actually pretty challenging, especially at night, poor weather, on a moving deck, um, because the human was having to do a lot of analysis of data and move a lot of controls to try and balance all the forces of nature to get the, uh, you know, the jet on the deck. When we look at that in F-35B, I said, well, hang on a minute, that, that, was that really value added? Did we really need the human to do all that difficult stuff? And so what they did was automate the ability for uh, you know the F-35 to hover. And so the process of hovering and landing an F-35B is now vastly simplified. Um, you know, and a whole generation of uh, air crew will be really thankful for that, especially when the weather's poor and it's at night and it, things are really difficult. So um, is it machine learning? Is it artificial intelligence? Or is it just autonomy? Uh, on a mode of autonomy. All of these things can make a huge difference to the way that humans do their job and do their job better. And I guess what we need to factor in is how much testing these systems undergo before being rolled out. 
So yeah, ab uh, absolutely, and that we have to take account of uh, you know the the legal, the ethical, the moral. These are all very difficult challenges where it comes to AI, depending on what the role is. So uh, if at some point in the future you do get artificial general intelligence, and we are decades away at that, and, and you know a computer entity that can learn itself how to do business and make its own decisions. Um, you know, that will be really very difficult. It, when, we, uh, when we go to war, the reality is it's a very, very controlled environment. Lots of rules of engagement and so on. And it's entirely right and proper that we do that. So, uh, you know, specific authorizations for engagements are all based on experience, training, knowledge, uh, and so on. So if you have something that is able to learn itself, how can you be sure of the decisions that it will make. So, you know, I sort of almost refer back to the previous answer. If all this bit of software is doing to you is prioritizing what it thinks you need to look at and it's just the human doing the looking, at what level of assurance do you actually need? Oh, sure, we would like to know that it's doing the right prioritization because otherwise it might miss something really important. That would be a bad thing. Uh, but at the same time, if, it, if it's not legally critical, it's not ethically critical, and it's not, you know, a, the foundation of employment, the lethal force or something like that, what levels of assurance do you actually need? So employing the right levels of assurance to the right elements of you know, artificial intelligence, which, as, as Patrick said, has a broad range of um, you know, elements underneath that. I, I think that's an important um, point, but Patrick might chip in and tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, so so I, I, if we go back to that F thirty five example, which I think is a really good exemplar, um, thinking about that uh, and, and that uh, at night landing on board under difficult conditions, um, that will be a predetermined set of software that allows the aircraft that level of autonomy to complete that landing. Um, I suppose where machine learning could come into that would be rather than loading another piece of software for a different type of ship to land on, um, the machine learning could learn the optimum way to do it. Yes, there is a potential it could go horribly wrong, but the machine learning could learn um, fr from lots and lots of landings on board and probably make a recommendation to make a change, to change something. You know, nine out of ten of these landings, you know, you, you were a bit hard or it didn't quite get down in the position it was supposed to go down in based on the weather conditions. And it can begin to learn that over a period of time. But, of course, in the same context that, that, that Jez has said about the thousands of pictures of tanks from every single angle, um, this would be exactly the same. It would need to learn it. I suppose you could do this in a synthetic environment. That would save you having to do it for real. But that's where machine learning can assist. It is still assisting the human. It is not replacing the human in that context. But presumably the Royal Air Force is also looking at using artificial intelligence or machine learning to validate decisions made by humans. How much will we rely on computers to check our work? Yeah, we do it every day, don't we? We, you, you know, if you've got a difficult sum, what you do? You get your iPhone out, do you get your calculator uh, on, and, and have a look? Uh, you know, I think uh, that's becoming natural in the way we operate these days. It, it's a basis of uh, confirmation, or, or not. It, it supports your decision making. It doesn't necessarily uh, make the decision for you. I used to fly two seat aircraft. And, you know, if there was a really difficult challenge going on, guess what we did? We talked to each other and say, well, what do you think? Uh, you know, I'm thinking this. And you would do that level of confirmation. This is where things like machine learning can help uh, that. So are they final decision makers? Not yet. Um, but it comes down to what level of autonomy are you employing? And I think we've covered there's a subtle difference between autonomy, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. In terms of how we grade threats, is the balance changing from the enemy's ability to throw a punch to an enemy's ability to communicate with its systems? That's uh, an interesting question. But let's, let's put it this way, that um, it, the OODA loop, observe, orientate, decide, act, which you know, has been around in warfare for decades, is still really, really important to us. You, you need to get round that OODA loop, i.e. Um, see what's going on, understand it, decide how to, what to do, and then do it. Um, you need to do that faster than your enemy. 
And that's the important point. And we have been really good at the UDA loop, but our enemies have also observed that we have been pretty good at it. And they've they've worked really hard at, um, you know, trying to gain parity or, or even being better. So I think what's really clear now is as we go forward, the future of warfare is very much about information. And therefore, you'll hear terms like information advantage. And, and what does information advantage really mean? Well, well, firstly, the information aspect. This is the right information to the right person at the right time. Uh, and what's the advantage bit? You're doing it better, faster than your enemy. And if you have information advantage, your, your decisions will be quicker and better. And, and the likelihood is your punch will land at the right place and at the right time. So you'll see a huge focus on you know, more sensors, collecting more data and ensuring that that's all disseminated into information for the warfighter and the commander. Uh, and the critical bit, and this is where AI and ML really come to play, is how do you turn all that data into information? If I could just sort of extend that even farther, even more importantly, so, so if you've got so many sensors out there now whether they belong to you or they belong to others or they're just open source sensors um, one of the interesting factors here are if we were to be purely human analysts involved with this as jez has already alluded to that you become cognitive overloaded very very quickly um, one of the interesting things is with machine learning if you think back to the tank um, you know, lots, you know, maybe a thousand images of a tank. So machine learning reacts better to more information, more variables, more information. You will stand a much higher chance of getting a better result. So in reality terms, the more information there. So information advantage really is about being able to, to gain more data, yeah, expedite the way you process that data, process it as close as possible to the point of collection, yeah, which will output useful information to inform so that you can then you can then cause the effect that you wish. Air Commodore Jez, I've heard you say never give a machine's job to a human. What do you mean by this? Uh, okay, that that's uh, an important aspect of how do we employ uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to give us information advantage. And what, what do I mean by that? that? Let's look at the amount of data that it is possible for us to be collecting in the future. Um, and where are those sources of data? I've got in front of me an iPhone. Uh, that's got a number of sensors on it already. And so it's got two cameras, it's got a microphone, it's GPS and various other things. Now, how many iPhones in the world I have no idea, but but it's got to be a lot, yeah? And how many other types of mobile phones and how many cameras uh, and how many CCTV cameras and how many other kinds of sensors? There is an enormous number of sensors out there collecting information all the time. And typically, they are specifically targeted to do one thing because that's how we work. Uh, and if I bring that into the military context, let me give you an example. If I have a reconnaissance pod on an aircraft, I typically am tasked to go and collect specific imagery. So uh, go and collect X number of photographs of this location here. Uh, and then we'll do the analysis on that specific location, those images, to understand if we can answer the question that we actually wanted to answer. So we end up tasking single sensors to go and answer single questions. But what if I just did a Google search? Can I answer that question? What if I can actually access all of the sensors that are already in that area? What if someone just posted on Twitter or on TikTok or on Facebook? Uh, you know, what about the local CCTV camera? What about the local traffic information that's monitoring how vehicles move around? There's an absolutely extraordinary amount of data out there um, that's available to us. And there's also an ever-increasing amount of data that we intend to collect. And some of the sensors that we are developing right now you know, are collecting multiple gigabytes of data per second. You know, that's the equivalent of several hours worth of HD video every second. So what involvement can a human have in trying to analyze that? Now, the, the reality is it's almost impossible to do it in a meaningful way. So we know we're going to have help. So how can this 
um, artificial intelligence and machine learning revolution change the way we do business here. Instead of perhaps focusing specifically on you know, that question, that sensor, that answer, what if we could uh, achieve all of this data and allow the machine learning and, uh, and AI algorithms to roam through it? Then not only are we you know, asking um, asking a question of a particular bit of data, but we're asking it of all the data. So instead of saying, go and take a picture of that area, why don't we just ask the question? You know, is there somebody at this location? And I don't care where the data source comes from. Well, currently we can't do that, but there's a, there is potential that AI and machine learning will bring that ability to us. But then it goes even deeper than that. What about the patterns that we can't see right now because we don't have the ability to see all the data? If we see all the data and allow the algorithms to run free, will they identify patterns we didn't know even existed? In fact, they may even be able to pick up trigger point patterns that shows what will happen in the future. And if we look at uh, the number of major events in the world that, in hindsight, we can see all the leading uh, you know, points of information that would have told us that something was going to happen, but we can't see it in real time. But here's the, here's the opportunity right now that AI and machine learning may be able to do that in near real time. And so this is absolutely about supercharging our ability to turn data into information. I mean, sort of drawing, drawing on that, uh, Jez. So exemplars being, if I want to know, and what I normally use for this is is uh, is my daughter, one of my daughters at school today. Now, in, in old speak, I would have probably had to ask for an asset to be tasked to go and fly over a school, maybe use a camera, use some facial rec recognition software yeah, during um, during one of the breaks to identify in a group of school children. Um, the way this is changing with the Internet of Things, I don't need to do that anymore. I just ask where she is by name to the internet, and any entry she's anything she's put into the internet will flag straight back up to me. Um, that that's a good example. Another example that machine learning can help us with is not what is what is out there by way of um, information, but more importantly that there isn't any information. That is just as useful in a lot of cases. Um, so you know everything has a digital signature. You know, if you think about this and the fact that if you do online shopping these days, you know, and, and, and you know, following that pattern that you you tend to buy the same things, yeah, all of a sudden you buy something different. If you're lucky enough to have an internet-ready fridge that reads your shopping as you load it, yeah, um, which is quite an interesting one. So there's a whole pattern of life begin be starting to emerge. So in areas where there is no pattern or no distinct pattern of life, that might be an individual, it might be a group, it might be be and it might be a government it might be anything to be honest with you it is very easy to see that using machine learning thank you professor patrick in asymmetric warfare between conventional forces and insurgents or independently acting terrorists how can artificial intelligence provide an advantage go on patrick you take this one okay so in exactly the same way, so looking at it, 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 the last 10, maybe 15 years worth of operations, um, in, in a counterinsurgency type operation, um, this goes back to exactly the same as um, you would have expected looking at some of these nations uh, and the lack of infrastructure within these nations that, you know, that this electronic signature wouldn't apply. It does apply even more so, to be honest with you. Um, most countries in the world have, have very active mobile telephone networks. Um, it's very, very easy to gain information from that. I think the other issue that we need to be very aware of, artificial intelligence and machine learning is in reality software. It is not difficult to produce software. You do not need a giant size factory, the same kind of environment that you would produce aeroplanes in, for example. Yeah, you need the ability to do this. One of the concerns for the Western world in particular is that some nations, in the same way that they would not be very fussy about exporting weapon systems, are certainly not fussy about exporting expertise within machine learning and AI to anybody that is willing to pay for it, which I think for, for 
particularly for the United Kingdom, and I know the RAF are looking at this, it means it spurred us on. We need to ensure that our information advantage, our artificial intelligence, our machine learning is better than our adversaries. Um, we just, in the, in the same context, we cannot think of those as peer or even peer plus adversaries. It's everybody. And presumably, the more we come to rely on this information, the greater the risk there is to countermeasures. Um, there is and there isn't. So, for example, certain machine learning techniques that, that are under development and so, some are much closer to reality than others, um, alleviate um, some deception. So you can go back to camouflage in, in the same context. You can camouflage an object. Um, so if you're, something's on the ground, if we take one of Jesse's tanks on the ground um, with a camouflage net over it, then you can find it using radar or you can find it using, you know, uh, infrared if it's hot. Yeah. So there are ways to counter um, you know, attempts on your machine learning. There are ways to counter for us to then obviously affect other people's machine learning. It's a never ending electronic battle. Okay, thank you. What is AI singularity? And, and, and when are we going to get that? Okay, AI singularity is the realization that we have created um, artificial general intelligence. The current academic thought, in other words, it has a level of self-learning cognitive ability. We're not going to set it off down a path to learn anything. It's become aware. Yeah, whatever aware means. I mean, I know plenty of humans that aren't very aware. I'm probably like that on a Friday afternoon when I've been working all week. But generally, the system is aware. Yeah, and that 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 singularity, that level of cognitive ability, yeah, that is directly recognisable um, as the same as a human, probably a child. Yeah, is not envisaged. Yeah, before about 2060. Does that mean a computer will have a conscience then? Um, conscious is a conscience is a whole different thing. Yeah, computers, I believe, it's an armor object. It probably won't. It might learn what is the ultimate, uh, what is the ultimate answer to a very various range of questions. So, for example, playing chess. Um, if you play chess against a computer, there are a number of, of of moves only. Yeah, based on the position, current positions. So, is it going to feel bad that it lost? There is a machine learning technique which has a reward feature within it um, called deep reinforced learning yeah where each of the agents that has and they're called agents that has machine learning on are electronically rewarded I don't think that means that they get any more electricity or you know more power but they are kind of rewarded for doing for completing tasks so no I do not believe we will ever see a computer system that will that will have the the, the same level um, that, that or all of the levels that a human has but if you give the computer all the information that you're talking about do, do you not think that there'll come a time when a, a computer can decide whether something is right or wrong um potentially it will decide what is right or wrong based on the inputs only. It won't have the same ability that a human has on what is really. If you think about it, uh, babies don't really understand what is right or wrong. Um, you know, that, that comes with, with, with being able to learn that as you go forward. And obviously in certain cultures, um, human cultures, certain things that are right are, are, are wrong in other cultures. So it's a cultural thing. I mean, I don't think we're going to see culturally different computers, yeah, even if we end up with a quantum system where you've got multiple, multiple outputs you know, or multiple ways of dealing with a problem. Um, I think that would be somewhat entertaining if we did end up with a computer that, that was um, had that level. But I don't think it, it's a reality, to be honest. OK, thank you. Finally, Air Commodore Jez, can I ask you about the Rapid Capabilities Office? This, I've never been to your office. It sounds fascinating. What do you do there? So, uh, Rapid, Rapid Capabilities Office, we were formed in uh, 2017 uh, really to help um, generate the cutting edge for UK air and space power. Uh, what does that actually mean? Uh, what it means is uh, our, our current acquisition processes 
um, you know, can be uh, quite slow and cumbersome in responding to immediate changes in situation, changes to the threat. Uh, and it's extremely good at big, delivering big strategic programs. But, but things change. Uh, and um, if you look at, I don't know, for example, Tempest, the fighter jet that, or system that might replace Typhoon, that will come into service 15 years away. And yet um, we're already having to close in on what the requirements might be. What does that mean? That means we have to guess at what 2035 might look like. What will be the demand? What will be the threat? What will be the environment? Uh, and yeah, in doing so, make some assumptions uh, and draw up some requirements and then try and uh, design, build, manufacture something to be able to deliver against it. So you know, that's quite a slow process. If you think 15 years ago, we didn't have an iPhone. You know, imagine that. So the world changes and it moves very, very quickly. So how can we help to tackle some of those rapid changes and are there opportunities we can use with uh, stuff that's already on the shelf um, through experimentation and trials to give uh, give options and opportunities? So, so that's our you know our DNA, if you like. We do a lot of experimentation and trials. Doesn't necessarily immediately result in a, um, uh, in taking something to the war fighter, but it might do. Um, but what it definitely does is help to inform what the opportunities are. Uh, we're, we're split down into three divisions. The future combat air system division that really is about um, uh, that is about uh, Tempest uh, and what we'll replace Typhoon with, uh, and that's uh, focused on doing the research and development of technical maturation, generating the skills within the UK. Uh, we've got a range of um, you know technology demonstration programs that are coming, you know, from sensors to new engines to make sure we're ready and we understand. Uh, the full opportunity that exists in research and development in combat air. And I've also got uh, the Air Information Experimentation Lab. That's where I'm sat right now. That's where Professor Patrick comes from uh, and you know, does pretty much what it says on the tin. We do experimentation around how do we do information advantage. Um, and then finally, I have a division that's called Projects, pretty bland name. Huh? And it's bland because it will ta tackle pretty much any challenge you throw at it. And it might be that it's spotted a new technology that's cropped up that we'll, uh, we'll be able to do some experimentation with. And we'll take it to the warfighter and say, you didn't realize you needed this, but it's going to change the way you do your business. Or it's because the warfighter will come to us and say, we've got a real challenge here. And for whatever reason, business as usual can't respond in the timelines or hasn't got a solution for us. And we'll, we'll have a go at that. Now, that's a really diverse team. It's a classic innovation hub. Um, and it's full of uh, scientists, civil servants, uh, and RF personnel. And we've got everyone, you know, from logisticians to operators, uh, commercial, uh, you know, you name it, we, we'll pack it all in. Uh, and, uh, you know, the point there is to try and be as holistic as possible when we tackle challenges, make sure we're looking at the information aspect, make sure we're looking at certification uh, and ensure that we come up with the best possible solution. And if necessary, trial and experiment or, or provide that. And to give you an example of some of the things that that, that division's up to, uh, it's the one responsible for delivering the Royal Air Force's Swarming Drone Initiative and the trials and experimentation with that. It's doing advanced robotic manufacture of uh, flares for defensive aircraft and expendable active decoys. It's looking at uh, rapid infrastructure builds for classified facilities. You know, the list goes on, you know, 120 odd um, uh, projects running there. So for our personnel on the ground uh, who have identified issues and the, the Air Force is renowned for attracting uh, some of the best minds in the United Kingdom to come and become aviators. If someone has, a, a, has identified a challenge and has got a solution or at least an idea for a solution, are you interested in hearing from them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm always interested in hearing from people, especially if they've got a, especially if they've got a challenge that they're really struggling with. Uh, and you know, another aspect of what we do in the Royal Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office is um, we help to run some of the innovation, the innovation strategy, uh, and we have uh, open calls where we we put out a request uh, as widely as we can for people to submit their ideas to us. Uh, you know, we have some uh, Royal Air Force funding to help with some of those ideas. There's uh, Astra. There's great opportunities for people to get involved in Astra and put their ideas in. We have access to Defence Innovation Fund, uh, so we can help to support and write up proposals and put those in. 
And, and of course, we have the, the RCO uh, resource as well uh, that we can put to task. Now, as is usually the case, I always have many more things to do than I have the people or resources to, you know, to do it with. And therefore, it's always an element of prioritization. But we will always try and help. And at one, of the, one end of the scale, I'll provide someone to come and sit with you uh, for a meeting and help you uh, facilitate the thinking and the analysis of the problem. And at the other end of the scale, we might uh, take on a full program that includes in-service delivery and support and disposal. Um, but I, I guess I, I'd just leave one thought with you, which is around problem architecture. And if I had my chief scientist alongside me, he'd be kicking me in the shins right now if I didn't talk about it. You know, we have a habit, quite frankly, of sometimes looking at shiny toys and thinking, oh, I'll, I'll, I'd really like one of those. Um, or we have a habit of, uh, I, my rifle's going out of service, I'd better replace it with a rifle. I just want one that's better, lighter, stronger, you know, boss bullets, whatever it is. You know, that, that, that is typically uh, how some things are done. But, but what we need to do now is start architecting problems. So what are you actually trying to solve? Uh, let me give you one example. If you have a reconnaissance pod on an aircraft, I'll come back to that. You know, we spoke about that earlier. And you said to me when I was flying to Orlando, we're going to replace your reconnaissance pod, it's old. Yeah, you would ask me, what, what do I want? And I would have said, well, I need another reconnaissance pod, but it's got to have a better sensor, better picture, collect more data, take more pictures, you know, disseminate it via, via radio communications or whatever. But that's closed thinking. Let's do that problem architecture. What are you actually trying to do? You're trying to collect data to get information. So the answer might not be a reconnaissance pod these days. It might be Google. It might be space. It could be a range of other things. So really architecting the problem that you're trying to solve and get down to what are the outcomes and the benefits you achieve, not the requirements, that's solutionary. What are the outcomes and benefits you're trying to achieve and how many different ways can I look at this problem? And then that will naturally lead into the best set of solutions for you to experiment with to see which solves the problem the best. And then finally, you know, don't try and get the 100% solution to start with. Right? You'll be wasting a long time. It'll cost you a lot of money because there's always risk in what we do. And we're playing with cutting-edge technology. It doesn't always work. You'll have seen what happened with Elon Musk. Yeah, but what did he say when that thing crashed yesterday? He said, that was a success. We got all the information we needed. So what's good enough? Uh, what is good enough for you right now? And then we'll use it and we'll learn how to make it better a bit and then a better a bit more and then better a bit more. Uh, get things in, get them up and running. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to try things, to experiment. You know, whether it's a new process or, or whether it's a new bit of kit, you know, we often focus on kit, but process, can change, process change can can. Uh, enable us as much as new bits of kit, but really think about what are you trying to, to do. I, I think as well, sort of further on that, obviously bias towards information, it's the department I work in, but one of the things that I found most interesting is the fact that, um, you know, it's a kind of dark art communications information systems is a bit of a closed shop. Um, machine learning and artificial intelligence has opened it to a much, much wider group. Um, what we're beginning to find things, so for example, if you stop and think about it for a moment, artificial intelligence is actually closer to human psychology than it is to computer science. Um, because that's how we wish it to work. So, so that makes it really interesting. So you don't need to, in all context, to be a geek to be involved in this. Um, you just need to be able to think. And I think we can all think. Air Commodore Jez Holmes, Professor Patrick Baker, thank you for coming on to Inside Air. I hope our people will look at situations uh, in front of them and seek you out and find you and share their problems. Yeah, and we'd absolutely value their input. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm NAC Victoria Andrews with another edition of Reheat, a recap of some of the recent news stories from the Royal Air Force. Ofsted has described the RAF apprenticeship scheme as outstanding, with the Air Force recognised as one of the top 10 employers in the UK. 
Set up in 1920, the scheme is in its centenary year, with 90% of new recruits undergoing this type of training in 24 different trades. At any one time, there are 3,400 apprentices in the Air Force. A fleet of electric cars have arrived at Aurea Fleming and Aurea Footering. The new green vehicles, though different to what we're used to, are part of the MOD's Ultra Low Emissions Vehicle Programme. A target set by the MOD will see 25% of White Fleet vehicles turn electric by 2023. Scotland's RAF Lossiemouth is further bolstering its role in UK and NATO defence and security by becoming the home of the new Wedgetail surveillance aircraft. The Wedgetail, which will replace the Sentry, is capable of simultaneously tracking multiple airborne and maritime targets. Using this information to improve situational awareness and direct assets such as fighter jets and warships. It comes as the base completes a multi-million pound facilities and runway upgrade program. The aircraft are due to arrive from 2023. The world's largest iceberg has been the subject of interest in a sortie over the South Atlantic. Measuring over 4,000 square kilometres, its sheer size means it's impossible to capture in a single photograph. The imagery captured from the Atlas A400M will be examined by scientists and observers to understand how the berg might move and behave in the weeks and months ahead. And finally to sport. Regiment gunner Lance Corporal Shan Wayne Stevens has piloted the Jamaican two-man bobsled at the World Cup. It's the country's first time to appear at the competition in 14 years. Himself and brakeman Matthew Wepke, a rugby sevens winger, hope to secure a place at the Beijing 2022 Olympics. The pair have had to think outside the box when it comes to training, however, with gyms closed and travel off limits due to coronavirus restrictions. Instead, they've been pushing a car around the streets where they live. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm SAC Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That's the sound of a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine from a Supermarine Spitfire. The one we played there is a very special one. P7350 is the last airworthy Spitfire to have actually fought in the Battle of Britain. It's now part of the fleet at the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight at RAF Coningsby. Initially designed by RJ Mitchell, the first Spitfire came off the production line in 1938 at a cost of around £9,500. It was the only aircraft to be produced before, during and after the Second World War. The first public sighting of a Spitfire in RAF colours was in May 1939 on Empire Air Day. The pilot barely landed his aircraft after forgetting to lower the undercarriage and was later fined £5. That's all for this episode of Inside Air, but please join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.